Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Quarter TV at Theatre. My name is Joe Crowley, and uh, great to see so many of you here this morning for, I think, not just a, a country file great, but something of a television legend. He won't like me saying that, but I think it's true. Yeah. Uh, he's a man perhaps most famous for creating a way uh, for the BBC to broadcast news to children. And, and many of you, some of you, yeah, will have grown up with his uh, trusted, warm, and very informative news round. He successfully made his way out of kids' telly, and if the best part of 20 years in kids' telly doesn't pigeonhole you, I don't know what was, does, but he managed to breach that divide that snared so many television personalities over the years uh, and move on to very successful things. He is now the longest-serving presenter on Country File by a Country Mile. He's been on the show since nearly the very beginning. And uh, the thing that always strikes me is, you know, I work with some of the teams that work with John, and if you ever work with a sound recordist who's worked with John, he will always say to you, or she would always say to you, he has the perfect diction. He's got the best voice in telly. They love him. They hear every word, every consonant he utters. So as somebody who is prone to gabbling or dropping a few T's, I'm going to be on my best behavior this morning. I urge you to do the same. Ladies and gentlemen, sit up straight, put your hands together for John Craven. You ever get to your face? The sound recorders say, "Oh, John, it's you know, an easy I've day never, today." Never heard that before, Joe. Never ah, heard it. No. Okay, breaking no, news no, here no, in the yeah. court of TV at Theatre. So, what do you make of Country File Live this year? Well, it's been fantastic so far. You're enjoying it? Yeah. I know it's early in the day yet, but uh, this is our fourth day, uh, and we've all had a fantastic time. The weather has not been as good as it is now. Yesterday, we were also filming uh, for the Country Fire program here as well, and yesterday I was in the middle of the lake at Blenheim uh, in a little rowing boat when <laughs> the lightning happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> not the best place to be. Um, but uh, it's, it's been superb. And for us on Country Fire, Joe, it's fantastic, isn't it? Because we get the chance to meet the audience. Mm. Uh, Normally, uh, when we're filming the programme, there's about four of us in the middle of a field or a forest or by a lake or something, uh, but we never see anybody, apart from maybe uh, the person we're interviewing and that's it. Uh, so to come to a show like this and meet the countryfile audience is a fantastic experience for us. We, we learn a lot from you. People tell us you know, what they like about the programme, what other things we sh think we should be doing on the show. Uh, and, and it's so nice to have this up, up front, up close, personal uh, meeting with the audience. Absolutely. Now, um, I know, as well as Country File, the thing you do get asked about an awful lot is news round. So yeah. we're gonna, we'll get some questions from you guys in a bit. I'm going to be selfish and, and hog John and ask him my questions first. But um, I'm going to take it a back a bit, really. So yeah. how did you get started in TV? Was there, was there a lucky break? Was there a moment that propelled you forward? Yeah. Yes, there was. I've had quite a few lucky breaks in my career. And I think some Hollywood star once had uh, on his tombstone written, he was lucky and he knew it. <laughs> and it's knowing when Lady Luck is riding with you, I think. Um, my, first, my first big break was when I was working on regional radio in Newcastle. Uh, and uh, I was a news writer. I was writing the scripts for the news bulletins. Uh, and one day, the newsreader was ill just before he went on air. Uh, and he said, I, I can't go on, I've got to go. So I was left on my own in the studio, and I had to read the bulletin. Uh, and luckily, I'd actually written it, so I, <laughs> I knew what the words were. Uh, and I managed to do it. Uh, I committed the cardinal sin of still speaking when the Greenwich time signal came oh. up for one o'clock. Uh, but the apart pits, from that, it, I did it. Yeah. And, that, and then the boss said, well, you, you seem to do it quite well. So I got a few more of those to do. And then I slowly got onto TV. Um, a, a guy called David Pritchard, who is now uh, famous for discovering Floyd, uh, Keith Floyd, uh, and Rick Stein, and people like that, and does all the, does all the big food programs. David was a little a, a film editor uh, on the regional show, and I was a would-be reporter. Uh, and we used to work at weekends with a cameraman who did it for nothing if it wasn't shown uh, on the telly. Uh, and that, um, and we, we started to make films together. And that's how I got into TV then. 
And I know you, you have to take advantage of your luck as well. And I heard you on the radio yesterday morning. You were saying that as a child, you were practicing reading bulletins. You'd read yes. the paper out to your, your yeah. parents, wouldn't you? Yes, I've always wanted to be a broadcaster, I think. And when I was about 12, I asked for a microphone as a birthday present. Goodness knows why. And it was one of these old-fashioned ones that the radio commentators used to use, you know, the, a, a sort of rounded thing you speak into. Uh, and, uh, and I used to set that up in the kitchen. Uh, my parents, uh, the lead led into the sitting room where my parents had to sit by the radio and my sister. Uh, and I sat in the kitchen with the microphone reading the front page of the Yorkshire Evening Post. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's how I started as a, a newsreader, really. And then network telly, because you were working, was it in the West Country as a reporter? That's right. And you got your break onto network telly, and that must have been a big moment. It was. Uh, again, Lady Luck. Uh, I worked on Points West, and I don't know if anybody's from the West Country here, but I, I worked on Points hey. West for quite a while. Good. Um, and uh, one day I went into the studio to record my commentary for that night's programme. Um, and there was a lot of strange people in there that I, hadn't, I didn't recognise. Uh, and I said, what's going on? And they said, we're auditioning for a new children's current affairs programme. Uh, and we spent two days doing auditions and we're just about finishing. So I said, well, can I have a go? And they said, well, I don't know about that. You know, uh, we've got hardly any tape left. And in those days, tape was incredibly expensive. Yeah. So, so I don't think we'll have enough tape left. But uh, if we do, we'll give you a ring. So I recorded my little bit and went back to the office and forgot about it. And then about an hour later, they phoned up and said, um, we have five minutes left on the tape. You can come down and have a go. So I went down, and I had to do a little piece to camera uh, and interview two or three children who'd been primed to be awkward. Aren't they all? I don't, uh, guess. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really need to prime them, do you? But um, they'd been doing it all day, so they really were fed up and awkward. <laughs> you know? uh, gave me a hard time. So I, I just forgot about it then because, you know, it, it hadn't been... If I'd been worrying about doing an audition for a few weeks, you know, yeah. I'd have been different, but I just went in and did it. And about five days later, I got a phone call saying, you are the new presenter of Search, which was, you know, I got the job. Uh, and that was the first current affairs programme for children, I think, anywhere in the world. We did uh, a little film. It was a weekly programme. I don't know if anybody is old enough to remember Search. Search, any viewers? But we had... Uh, Keeping your heads down, not, not admitting to it. <laughs> we had a, made a little film about a subject, like how do you get on with your parents or your grandparents or your, that sort of thing. Uh, and, uh, and then we had a studio full of children giving their opinions. And that became so successful, it went daily. And that's where kind of news round comes well, no, from, it, right? It was, uh, what happened was, after about two years of doing search, uh, the bosses realised there was a little hole in the schedules twice a day on a, on a Tuesday and a Thursday of about six minutes because they bought American cartoons uh, uh -huh. and, you know, they are, they are made to have the commercials fitted into them. So there was that gap. Uh, and so they didn't know how to fill it. And so somebody said, well, why don't we try a news programme for children? And all the research that had been done said, you're on a loser if you do a news programme for children because they're fed up of the news. They're tired of being told by their parents to be quiet when the news is on. Yeah. So they built up a huge resistance uh, to anything to do with news. So that was the challenge. They gave me six weeks, twice a week. And because I would, I'd done search, the audience knew me. Uh, and I thought of the title News Round because that's a bit like having a paper round, you know, course, sort yeah. of relating it to children, having a news round. So the big boss said, well, yeah, but if it's a, if it's a paper round, you know, it's Joe Bloggs' paper round or it's Kate Smith's paper round, uh, so we'll make this John Craven's news round. So that's how he got the title. Wow. Uh, and we did, it for, uh, we did it for six weeks, and there wasn't much research done into it. Uh, but... After two or three programmes, uh, a friend of mine phoned up and said, uh, I've, uh, I was out in the garden just now, and my little boy came running out to tell me about a treasure ship that had been found sunken in the English Channel. And uh, his dad said, well, how do you know about that? And he said, I've just heard it on the news. So his dad <laughs> said, well, don't be silly. The news isn't on until 6 o'clock. Yeah. And the little lad said, no, I heard it on my news. Yeah. So that's it. We've struck home. <laughs> and it seems obvious now, and I grew up watching news around, I'm sure many people did, but then it, the people hadn't really thought of it. Was there criticism 
uh, for exposing children to the news? Oh, was yes. there resistance? Yeah, I mean, there were letters in the time complaining about somebody not wearing a suit reading the news on BBC One. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided right from the start it should be casual, so I didn't sit in, in, in behind a desk because that, I'd be a bit too much like a teacher. And in those days, teachers wore suits as well. So um, I sat in front of a desk and I was in casually dressed. Um, and yeah, people complained about us doing a news bulletin for children. Some, well, not too many people, but some did. Uh, and one of the arguments was that we were destroying the garden of childhood. Uh, that you know, children shouldn't be told about these kind of things. Um, my answer to that was, if we didn't tell them, they'd hear somewhere else, you know, a, a hurried radio bulletin or a grown-up bulletin that they didn't understand. So we would explain to them in the best and most reassuring way possible about what was happening. Uh, somebody said to me, you're destroying the garden of childhood. And I said, that is not true. What we are doing is we're in that garden of childhood and we're putting up a ladder against the wall of this garden so that our young audience can climb the ladder, look out and see the outside world and have somebody that they know and trust to tell them what they're seeing in the outside world. And that's the way I've always looked at Newsround. And of course, it's still going strong yeah. all these years later. Yeah. Uh, John, your microphone is, is, is trying to escape your cheek there. So I'm going to hand right. you this one. Shall I use your this one? constant pressure you're carrying on anyway. But yeah, yeah, lose that. Just that's it. Perfect. Oh, we got that. I hope not. We'll uh, let's have this one. Sorry, there we go. Uh, thank you very much. Look at me sitting here, not even standing up. I, thank you very much, Maria. That's very kind. Uh, let's try that. Is that better? Is that working? Yes. Good. You can all hear yeah. John, can yeah. you? Great. Did I finish that? Um, yeah. No, no, no. That was great, and that's a way into. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious. Then today, yes, we still have news round, but we also have just information everywhere. It's very difficult to shelter children in the way that, that you were sort of helping to do. Yeah. I mean. I'll be forever grateful to the parents of Britain when I was doing years round that they trusted me. We were kind of loco parentis, you know. Uh, often there was no adult in the room when we were doing the program. Uh, so, you know, the parents trusted me. Uh, and we were, in, when we first started news round, there were only three channels. Sorry. There were only three channels. Um, so, um, that was the only source of news, really, at that time of day. It was long before uh, 24 hour news, you know, uh, even before lunchtime news. Uh, Newsround was the first bulletin of the day, so an awful lot of people who were shift workers yeah. got their news from Newsround. Um, but we could, in a way, channel the news to our audience in a way that nobody else was reaching them. Yeah. Now they get their news from the you know, from their laptops and their tablets and whatever, you know. Uh, and it does worry me, the unchecked, untrue news uh, that is on a lot of these uh, uh, mobile devices. Uh, there's no way of filtering now no. what children are watching. You know, you read about eight-year-olds, you know, looking at porn. Uh, so... I think these are much more troubling times, and I don't know what we do uh, to try and protect children uh, from things and they shouldn't be reading, shouldn't be seeing. Yeah, well, the BBC certainly has a role to play in keeping news around going, doesn't yeah. it, in terms of yeah. Um, yeah. helping with that. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's move on to Country File. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can answer this for me. It's so successful. Why? Well, I think... Uh, I could say 7 o'clock on Sunday <laughs> evening on BBC One. <laughs> it's not a bad spot to it's have. It's not. It's no. sort of glass of wine territory. <laughs> You've had your Sunday roast, yeah. 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 Uh, of course, we started many years ago uh, on Sunday mornings at 11.30 on Sunday mornings. We took over from the farming programme, which had been going for 25 years. So a lot of farmers didn't like the idea of losing their programme. But what other industry has its very own television programme? Mm. You know? So... Uh, Country Files started to give a broader picture uh, of the countryside, not just farming. You know, we didn't have fat stock prices and things like that on Country Files. Uh, but I think farmers slowly came to realize that this was a great platform for them. You know, that, uh, especially as people became more aware uh, of how food is produced, uh, um, accountability, traceability, uh, welfare issues. Um, 
I mean, I started on country file at a rather bad time because there was an awful lot of animal diseases around, you know, BSE and Salmonella, and then it ended up with, of course, with, with the awful foot and mouth outbreak in 2001 uh, when we went live every yeah. week to report on that. Uh, but I think farming is an essential part of our countryside, but it's not the be-all and end-all. You know, tourism actually brings in more money to the rural economy than farming. And what Countryfile now does is we still have these gritty issues uh, that are uh, very central to the program, you know, uh, uh, farming issues, uh, issues to do with what it's like to live in the countryside. It's not all a glamorous life. It's not all roses round the door if you live in the countryside. There are lots of social issues. There's, you know, you're, you're losing your pubs and your shops and your schools, your bus services, all those sort of things. We look into this on Country Farm. But we also have a lot of fun as well, don't we, Joe? Yeah, well, we uh, do. You know, we go to some beautiful places. Uh, there's always a fantastic, stunning opening sequence to the program. And if you go along to our arena theatre uh, today, we've got three more shows on, uh, you'll see an amazing inter interpretation of the opening of Country Farm done by uh, a circus uh, team and they are absolutely brilliant but we do go to lovely places we see lovely things we meet fantastic people and we're also doing our bit for rural tourism because what we hope is that mm. if you've seen a particular place that you like on country file you get off your bottoms out of your armchairs and go and see the place for yourself and in that way you'll help to boost uh, rural economy Absolutely. Uh, now, you're a newspaper man originally, way back, and, and, and now, and there's always been, you'll know this, there's been this relationship between newspapers and TV, and TV sometimes, we sort of nick stories that have been done in print, and then we do them on TV afterwards, yeah. just occasionally. But now, with the popularity of Country File, uh, there are these Twitter headlines, I which know. are remarkable, which is where people go and write fairly trashy news stories about nothing, but they, it's a good headline. That's it's right. all done off Twitter, isn't it? And you've it's been the first time we've the subject of this. I have. It's the first time we've ever experienced this. On, uh, when, when Country File was in the mornings, we got a, a pretty healthy audience of about 2 million people. Now we get up to 8 million, uh, especially on a cold winter night. You know, we get a big audience. But just the other week, we had 7 million on a lovely summer, uh, summer evening. Uh, so that means the press are much more interested uh, especially certain red top newspapers, uh, <laughs> what we do uh, on Country Farm. So, well, yeah, well, what I'm thinking is there was, there, was a, there was an example from here last year, the first Country Farm Live, That's right. and uh, they made it sound like you'd had a, basically had a fist fight with Matt Baker. Yeah, I was, you know, <coughs> we, were, we were doing, uh, we're filming the program here as well, and I, I have the Craven Arms, which uh, I recommend. Uh, it's got good local beer. You'll find the Craven Arms just up the road. Um, and I was pulling a pint uh, in the Craven Arms, and Matt came in. This was, you know, filming for, for the program. And we'd arrange, he'd come in and ask, and ask for a silly order, you know, a thousand free pints or something. <laughs> uh, so I did my best Barbara Windsor impression. And I said, get out of my pub! <laughs> and that got in the it papers did. as Matt and I having a huge row. And, and I've actually taken the liberty, I know our screens are a bit reflective, there's four dotted around if you can see them, but um, if this will click and work through, go on, please work for me. Oh, there we go, can you see that, the headline there? Get no. out of my pub, Get out of my pub. thrown into chaos. <laughs> As John Craven lashes, lashes out at Matt Lakers. How about that? Much more violent. <laughs> and another one which was my favourite, I think this is from this year actually, um, yeah. is... Country wow. presenter John Craven sends Twitter into meltdown with nipple bearing <laughs> jumper. I never oh, thought John Craven's <laughs> nipples would make headline news. Um, yeah. But Neither that is I. the success of Country Farm. Yeah, and how could, it, how could my nipples throw anything into chaos? <laughs> you know, or into meltdown. Wow. <laughs> they were like, uh, no, out what, was they ha what happened there was uh, I was doing a film about. Uh, fishermen along the northeast coast uh, wearing their ganses, their fishermen's jerseys that their wives knit for them and they're very, very skin tight because if they fall into the water, I mean they're very thick wool and if they fall into the water, hopefully it will stop too much water getting onto their body and they won't die of hypothermia. So they are very tight and I hadn't realised quite how tight <laughs> when I was doing my piece to camera 
But I never thought, nobody in the office said anything about it, you know. And, and not, sods, the director didn't sods. say anything, or the cameraman didn't say anything, you know. Uh, I'm not sure what they'd say, though. I don't know how you, how you change your nipples at that I moment know, time. I know, Anyway, I'm very careful not to show my nipples too much now. <laughs> Uh, you know, you've done a lot in, in your career. You know, is modelling now a way forward? You know, we've got we've got the folio I know, starting. I know, I could do page three now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I, I want to ask you about one of your favourite country fire films, but I know there's been so many, it's, it's hard to pick them out. But actually, there was one relating. I think it was the North Sea, wasn't it? Recently, it that was. particularly stays in mind. Yes, I mean, when we make country fire, we only have two days a week in which to do the filming, uh, and we do a lot of wildlife items on the, on the program. And so we just have to keep our fingers crossed that we'll actually see the wildlife we're, we're hoping to, uh, to discover. Uh, I don't think any of us have ever seen a busking shark yet. <laughs> you know, we've <laughs> been, out, we've we been out and looked for them, but we've never seen them. Uh, um, we took on one challenge uh, a couple of, uh, about, about a year ago now, uh, out in the North Sea off the Northumberland coast. We were hoping to look for black-browed dolphins, which are pretty rare species, and they don't come inshore. They, if you do see them, you've got to go about 20 miles out into the North Sea. Uh, so we were taking a big chance. Some programs, a lot of those wonderful wildlife programs, you know, have days, weeks, months mm. to get the shots that they want. We have one day. So off we went into the North Sea, fingers crossed, and we'd no sooner got out there uh, than a pod, two pods, of these dolphins came rushing to see us and they were leaping around all over the boat and we, we had a, a, a diver with an underwater camera and he'd leapt in and got some fantastic shots of them. Uh, and, and then later on, the Natural History Unit asked to borrow our footage, which I was uh, oh. really proud of. But that was a fantastic experience. And, you know, it, we have to be lucky. And we yeah. were talking earlier on about luck. Well, on Country Fire, we have to, have to be lucky. A, with the weather, you know, because we have to keep going no matter what, don't we, Joe? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's what makes the show real, I think, that you, you see us battling against the elements sometimes to, to do the programme. Yeah, and, uh, and if you don't see the dolphins that day, and nine times out of ten or more, you won't, it's just a film in a boat. There's not much to see in the that's right, got, that isn't happening. Well, we did, on the way out, stop at the Farne Islands okay. and do a little bit about the birds of the Farne Islands to use as a standby if necessary. Tricky, but we didn't it? have to use them much about it. Uh, I will open up for questions in a second. I just want another um, one to you then, John. I mean, when you've had this really long career, and this is something I'm sure I can learn from and Matt and others, you know, how do you keep it fresh? Because you will be going back and doing sometimes similar films that you've done yeah. before. How do you keep your sort of professionalism going? Well, I don't know. It's because I love what I'm doing, really. Yeah. Uh, and I've, you know, over the years, I've been doing Country File for uh, 28 years now. Uh, and uh, I've been to back to the same places several times. But I go back with a different film crew, a different director, different researcher. They found new things that I, I didn't know about. Uh, I mean, I'm from Yorkshire, and I love the Yorkshire Dales, but a couple of years ago, uh, I discovered a new dale that I didn't even know existed. It's called Crummock Dale, and it's about uh, eight miles long. It's uh, near the Lancashire border, uh, and it has some amazing stone formations created after the end of the Ice Age. Uh, and the fantastic thing about it, they look as though they've been done by sculptors, these stone formations. Uh, and the lower stones are actually younger than the older stones that are on top of them. So it, it, it's an um, amazing geographical feature, geological feature. And Crummockdale, what a lovely name as well. Yeah. But uh, I never knew it existed. So you keep, that keeps happening. You know? I keep getting surprised. And that, and that keeps me enthusiastic. Fantastic. And there's a little tip there. Anyone going to Yorkshire, you know, this August on holiday? Go and visit. So let's see if we can, we can make our microphones work and we'll open it up to you guys for a few questions. Who would like to kick us off? There is a man right at the back there. He's going to test your running skills, Maria. Thank you. Anyone else we can get another microphone out to? A lady over there. If we can go there, Sasha. Thank you. Keep your hand up till it gets to you. Thank you. Right, sir, take us away. Hi. Um, if you could choose one programme, would it be Swap Shop? News round or country file, and why? Ah, <laughs> uh, why? Well, I'd choose them all, you know, be mm. because because they're all so different. I mean, with news round, I had this fantastic opportunity uh, to to talk to the nation's children, and everybody uh, here at the show, or most people, 
come up to me and mention Newsround. Uh, and <laughs> sometimes people who I think look rather old say, you were part of my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> How does that make me feel? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a fantastic opportunity, and I loved doing that. Uh, and it took me to some amazing places around the world, and I met some people I never dreamt I'd meet. Like, I went to Calcutta and met Mother Teresa. Uh, she actually opened the door for me. <laughs> I knocked on her little mother house, as it's called, in the back streets in the slums of, of, of Calcutta, and she opened the door. <laughs> Mother Teresa, a saint to be. Um, and like, yeah, lots of wildlife films we did around the world. Pandas, of course, did lots of stories about pandas. So th that was a fantastic experience. And then Swap Shop. Who remembers Swap Shop? Yeah. Can you remember the number? 01811 <laughs> <laughs> You still got it on speed dial all these years later. <laughs> and that was a great uh, change of gear for me, if you like. I started off being the serious person, and I said, did a lot of serious stuff on Swap Shop, because the bosses thought, we can't have three hours of live television uh, without a bit of grit in it. So I was the bit of grit originally. The Swap Shop was the first three hour live program on television, apart from sport. Uh, and, and we had no script, we just sort of made it up as we went along. Wow. It was fantastic. Uh, but it also made, I could show a bit of a lighter side, so it helped me with news round that they didn't think I was a totally serious person, you know. Yeah. Uh, and when I'd fin I was editor of news round, and when I, uh, when I got to a certain age and you know, the grey hair started to come along, um, and uh, you've got to jump up and down a lot on children's television, mm -hmm. and it was uh, you know, getting a bit beyond me. So I thought I'd leave. Uh, and I announced it on the Saturday morning TV show that I was leaving. Uh, and then on the Monday, the BBC phoned me up and said, do you fancy doing something a bit different? Wow. We've got this new programme called Country File, uh, which is a rural affairs programme. Uh, do you fancy doing that? And I thought, well, why not? You know, it's because it's, it's often quite difficult for a children's presenter to break out of that mould. You know, you're put in a pigeonhole as a children's presenter, yeah. and yeah. sometimes it's hard to get out of it. Uh, Peter Purvis, who's here today, he proved it's easy as well. Uh, but... Um, I said, yes, please, because, you know, take me down country roads, different way to go, a lot of luck again there, Joe, with that offer. Uh, and I, saw, I said, I'll do it for three months and we'll see how we go. Uh, and I'm 28 still here, years later, still here, here we are. It's <laughs> a so nice try, sir. He wasn't answering the question. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the lady's just there. Yeah. Good morning. Um, the country file calendar is a, is a lovely thing. Um, but could you ask the printers to do a slimline version because some of us haven't got big walls to put the calendar on. <laughs> Take down your prized artwork, make room. Oh, go on, John. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't quite hear the full question. So the full question was, can we do a slimline version of the Country File calendar because some people don't have enough wall space. Oh, right, no, Because they're no keeping way. all the past Country File no, calendars. No, we needed that yeah. size to show off the beauty of the photographs, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I've just been, this week, uh, judging the pictures to go into next year's calendar uh, with Deborah Meaden, you know, from Dragon's Den, uh, and, and Simon King, the wildlife photographer. Uh, and this year, for the first time, uh, we accepted pictures uh, by, by online, you know, uh, and we got a fantastic... I, I was a bit worried that we might get a lot of trashy pictures, you know, if you could just so easy just to flick them onto online. But we got some amazing photographs. I think it was the most difficult year yet. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so another and great it's going to be a sensational calendar. Great. I mean, this year's, this year's raised £2.2 .2 million pounds for children in need, which was amazing, a record amount. Wow. And I hope that, uh, you know, next year's will do even better. Yeah, and a big thank you to you guys, actually, and everyone that buys yeah. it, because it does make a huge difference. And I know that we... I always find it's a bit of a running joke. We just plug it endlessly, but we have to, and it's, uh, and it's yeah. all for a good cause, and there's always a smile and a smirk while we're doing it, I yeah. think. A um, couple more questions. Let's, yeah, uh, we'll come to you, and we got, let's start at the back there, and then we'll bring the mic forward. Hi, I don't know if you remember, but did, did you enjoy filming, I think it was a program called Country Cops, Country Hops, was that? Cops. Cops, Country Cops. Oh, Country Cops, I remember Country Cops. We did it in Rydale in North Yorkshire. Uh, it was a, a long series uh, about what it's like to be a country policeman. Were you involved at all? Oh, I'm sorry. I so we've lost the mic there. Uh, you yeah. weren't involved, or you were? 
Okay, he was watching. An avid viewer, You're watching. a fan. We made a big mistake with Country Cops because we happened, well, I didn't, but the producers happened to choose the area of the countryside with the second lowest amount of crime. <laughs> <laughs> so, You're earning your money on this one. We didn't have a lot to film, you know. We, <laughs> we had one young rookie copper trying to find somebody who was stealing things off, you know, what they call them, on, you know, on top of the, in tires where you put the air in and you put the cap on. The you know, and people uh, are, uh, you know, hubcaps? Hub not hubcaps, oh, the, the, little the little things, you know, that you put on top of the... Uh, of, of, of the... Uh, wow. <laughs> he, he was looking at them. What are they called? I got, yeah. Dust caps on there, uh, yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. Was that up lot. there? Was that with the, with the crime stories you had that That series? was a big crime story. Um, but... Um, I want to move there. It was, it was <laughs> good fun. We had a lot of fun. And, and they were a wonderful bunch of coppers. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, yes, madam. Uh, John, is there, is there anything else you'd like to achieve in your working career? I don't think so. I don't think Next I want question. to achieve no, anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm semi-retired now. You know, um, I still do country fire because I love it. It, it, it. Like Newsround, you know, it, I like to think of them as my babies. Swap shop, Newsround, country fire. Um, and I still get a great kick from doing it and working with all these fantastic people. Uh, and uh, no, I mean, I, I work when I feel like it now, you know. And now and again, people ask me to do something a bit different, you know. Um, I, I, I was in Gareth's choir for children in need. That was quite fun. Um, we got to number one. I know. In the charts. Number one record yeah, holder, maybe. Yeah. Never thought I'd be a number one record uh, <laughs> person. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm doing The Chase. That's on soon. I, I did quite well in The Chase. Anybody watch The Chase? Yeah. yeah. I'm sure you're not supposed to give it I'm away not, beforehand. I, no, but, I, can't uh, yeah. I can't reveal I don't think the bookies will take bets on it, so don't yeah. worry. But for one stage during the program, I was very pleased. Um, so, yeah, it's nice to do a few odd different things. And you have to, I mean, I, you, you say you still love it, so I'm sure there's no question here, but at 28 years, I mean, you've got to at least get to 30, haven't you? Well, all depends. <laughs> all depends on the bosses. <laughs> um, I don't know, I always say that uh, I won't retire, they will retire me. Right. So... <laughs> If he's gone, he's been pushed, ladies and gentlemen, but he won't be pushed because we love him. A um, couple more questions. Yes, let's go to this gent over here. Anyone else over here? We'll get a microphone to you. Uh, there's a boy just at the back at the fence, uh, Maria. Thanks. Hello, so. John. As, as a former sound man on both Points West and Swap Shop, I endorse the comments about your diction. There, oh. there never was a problem. In your retirement, have you thought of giving elocution lessons to the actors that need <laughs> subtitles? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. A lot of mumbling actors out there. John, you could, you could yeah, be well, their saviour. I totally agree with you. I mean, I get so annoyed when I'm watching a, a really good drama uh, on telly and the actors mumble away. Uh, I don't know, maybe actors think they're allowed to do that, to be realistic or something. Uh, but I have to put the subtitles on for quite a few dramas these days. Really? You know, because I just can't follow what they're saying. And watching uh, Country File back, do the subtitles go on then? No, well, everybody speaks beautifully on oh, Country even, even you, Joe, you know. <laughs> yeah, so. And actually, I know you like your dramas, don't you? You're, that's your way of relaxing. That's your downtime when you're back home, TV dramas. I do. I like watching... Well, I watch TV if there's anything good on, you know. <laughs> that's loaded. Uh, <laughs> so some nights I look down the schedule. Mm -hmm. But, um, no, I like... Oops, I like dramas. Uh, I like... I follow dramas on Sunday nights and Monday nights because I know I'm going to be at home. I don't like catch-up TV much. I don't like to... I'm not a great Netflix fan. I mean, I did watch The Queen and things like that on Netflix, but I'm not a great uh, sort of TV album man. You know, I like to watch... I like an appointment to watch. Country File is very much <laughs> an appointment to watch. Not a lot of people record Country File and watch it later. Is that right? I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, People sit down on a Sunday evening, maybe had a hectic or a nice casual weekend. They sit down, have a glass or something maybe, uh, and let the British countryside waft over them. And I, th I think it's the perfect BBC One Sunday night. Country File, Antiques Roadshow, Paul Dark, <laughs> last episode tonight. 
Will you be home in time? Will you have left the Craven Arms? Will you still be pulling pints? And then the news. And then bedtime. That's my Sunday night. There you go. So no one ever called John on a Sunday night. He won't answer the phone. I won't. Um, yes, young man. What's your favourite marine animal? Marine animal, favourite wow. marine Wow. Well, I don't know. I was incredibly lucky a couple of years ago. A friend of mine called Mark Carwardine, who's a, a, a biologist and a wonderful wildlife photographer. He's on the radio and TV sometimes. Um, he runs whale watching trips in Baya, California. You fly to San Diego in California and then get in a quite small boat and go down uh, to Baya. Uh, and we saw just about every whale you could hope to see. We saw lots of humpback whales. We saw blue whales. Uh, we had a blue whale and her calf alongside us in the boat and going, heading out into the Pacific. And we followed her for, for an hour or so. It was a magical, magical time. Wow. And then we went into this lagoon where the grey whales have their babies. Uh, and because our boat was quite short, uh, quite small, we could get over the sandbank and into this lagoon. Uh, and the baby, I say baby, sm they're about 15 foot long, these babies. <laughs> um, they were coming up to our little boats uh, and w uh, rubbing, w rubbing their noses and they were blowing at us, you know, wetting us with their blow from their blowholes. And it was absolutely fantastic to be soaked. The mums would pop up, you know, these 60 foot long mums would pop up to make sure that their babies were okay and then pop down again and just left the little ones with us. And I've never so known anything quite like it. It's wow. a life changing moment. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. Look, I'm aware we've actually run a bit over, so I think we're going to have to call time there. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, John, obviously, will be appearing regularly on Country Files, so look out for that. But also Country File Diaries, just worth saying that's coming yes, up. Yes, Country Files Diaries is our new project. It goes out uh, on daytime TV at 9.15 in the morning after the breakfast program. Uh, we do five programs in a week, and it gives us the opportunity to look in, in, in greater depth at the different seasons. So Country File itself will do a seasonal special like it's doing a summer special shortly. And then on the Monday to Friday afterwards, we do Country File Diaries looking in greater depth uh, at, at the season. And, it, and it's great fun to do. I think it's coming on soon, isn't it? The, the, the summer yes, it series. Is. It so is. I don't know exactly when, but uh, do no, look out for know. that. So but you're on it as well, Joe. Yes, got a very good film on water shortages. Yeah, I uh, yeah, urge yeah. you to watch. Um, anyway, please put your hands together once again for the brilliant John Craven. Thank you very much. Thank you.